My name is Daniel Pugh, and I'm going to be moderating this next session entitled Virtual Sex, Using Interactive Digital Media to Reduce Shame and Sexual Risk Taking. Uh, this session was to go until 3 o'clock, but obviously we are running behind, so we are going to go past that to probably about um, quarter after 3, so we welcome you all to stick around if you are interested. Um, so we are going to, um, I'm going to introduce you to John Christensen here, who's going to lead you through a multimedia presentation, uh, and hopefully there will be an opportunity for questions and answers at the end. So the description for this session is, um, this session will describe the development and evaluation of two digital media HIV prevention interventions funded by the U.S. National Institutes of Health. One utilizes an interactive movie format with filmed human characters and the other is a video game populated with artificially intelligent virtual humans. And the presenter for this afternoon's session is John Christensen, who is an assistant professor in the University of Connecticut's Department of Communication. And John's area of research focuses on improving mental and physical health through the use of interactive digital media, such as mobile apps, video games, and virtual reality. So please join me in welcoming John. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming, everyone. Um, I'm happy to see so many people are interested in technology and how we can use it to make people healthier. Uh, the title of my talk, of course, is a Digital Media. I wanted to avoid a more uh, uh, concrete term because there are so many different applications out there. Today I'm going to be talking about interactive movies and, an, and a video game. And so uh, this is work that begun while I was a doctoral student in Los Angeles at the University of Southern California. And it's under a paradigm called SOLVE, Socially Optimized Learning in Virtual Environments. And the idea here is that we design interventions for health, evaluate them, figure out how to optimize them so that they have more effectiveness or a broader reach and so forth. And we repeat. First, let me uh, start by acknowledging uh, my collaborators. Uh, the principal investigator for the projects that you're going to see here today was my doctoral advisor, Lynn Miller. This, these are uh, her ideas, her, her babies that she's been uh, kind of crafting ever since uh, the HIV epidemic uh, began many, many, many years ago. Her husband, Steve Reed, also a big player in this, uh, this area. And then two additional students, Robert Appleby and uh, Carlos Godoy, who along with me have been working on this uh, for, for a while now. And I also have to say that the first intervention was uh, kind of uh, funded by the NIAID, and then the second one, the video game, NIMH. Okay, I want to start by talking about our population of interest. Uh, we're going after men who have sex with men here, MSM. Uh, they represent a, a lot of the new cases, of course, in HIV infection. We wanted to kind of develop interventions that would really recapture the attention of youth that may have tuned out to traditional interventions or traditional approaches to HIV prevention. Um, one particular area that we're interested in is reducing uh, feelings of shame. Social stigma uh, can, uh, rejection and stigma can lead to this painful emotional state which has been linked to risk taking. And so we think that by kind of helping people manage these negative feelings that they may get from society, from church, from family, from, from friends even in school, maybe we can actually uh, help change people, ch help people change their behavior for the better as well. And so shame is linked to a lot of negative uh, outcomes here, especially uh, things like behaviors that can harm the self, including HIV risk behaviors, which I'm going to be focusing in on today. All right, so just a little bit about the theory behind SOLVE. In addition to theories such as uh, theory of planned behavior or, or social cognitive theory, which we do utilize in these interventions, uh, we do base uh, a lot of our work on a decision-making uh, model from neuroscience by the Damasios and, and Bashara. And of course, we talk about facts and the options and knowledge and skill building, things that are in traditional interventions. But uh, we also talk about emotion, affect. And uh, today, I'll be focusing in on shame, as I mentioned. And our, our model does take that into account as a parallel factor when uh, changing risk behavior. So we wanted to create something fun to kind of, as I mentioned, recapture the attention of youth. So we made movies. Living in Los Angeles, it was very, very easy for us to access uh, large groups of people who wanted to participate in these uh, projects. Um, what I'm going to show you today is from the Virtual Sex Project intervention designed for young MSM. And in this, it's kind of a choose-your-own-adventure, you can imagine, uh, on a DVD originally, but now it's been moved to interactive videos on the web. And you, the user, get to 
take control of the action and choose what happens in the narrative, in the storyline. Actually get to make decisions using your remote control or your keyboard that actually influence the storyline. And so users do go on a virtual date, and uh, here you can see us filming many, many, many clips. Some are 30 seconds long, some are 45 seconds long, some are five minutes long. So that really ends up being a more tailored experience that you can control. All right, here are a couple of choice points in this interactive DVD. You can uh, figure out whether you want to go to a bar to meet your potential partner on that date, whether you want to go online and so forth. Uh, we give you options for alcohol use, drug use, how you want to talk about condoms, that sort of thing, the type of sex you want to have. Uh, we do actually have persuasive messages, health messages, that we'd like to give to people. And so we do that through these peer guide characters who sometimes interrupt. For example, if you've made a risky decision, the action stops, it pauses, they come on the screen, and they tell you facts, give you skills that you should maybe uh, think about uh, doing in the future, and kind of a positive encouragement. Uh, and so we actually had a budget to create three separate uh, interactive videos uh, for those three uh, target populations that I mentioned uh, that were highest risk uh, at the beginning of this. Now, we actually had screenwriters uh, who were members of the population. We had our director, director of photography, producers, all members of this target population. So it was really designed uh, with them in mind and their input. OK, so how actually did we go about trying to reduce feelings of shame? Well, there are a couple ways. The two main characters, that's the guy that you are playing, and then your potential sex partner, um, they model positive self-appraisals, which is unfortunately something that a lot of young MSM don't do. They don't feel very good about themselves a lot of the time, especially in Los Angeles, where you have to be very popular and pretty, I think, a lot of the times, they feel. Um, also, the storylines uh, that we wanted to con convey uh, that you can avoid uh, sex, and it's in your control. A lot of times people say, well, I kind of intended to use a condom, but something else happened. It wasn't my fault. I, I got pressured into it or something. And things happen, but we want to basically make people feel self-efficacious and give them the ability to feel confident in themselves and their decisions and follow through with their intentions. Um, and then also, we wanted to have those two peer guide characters uh, engage in a little affirmation there. We wanted to make the user feel good about himself. So also, uh, we, when we intervene in localized uh, places throughout the intervention, we use an ICAP process. So we interrupt the automatic decision making. We want to slow that automatic decision making down, pause, think about what you're about to do. Right? And then we like to challenge the situation and say, hey, could you ever think about doing this? We also acknowledge the desires. We say, yeah, that guy sure is hot, but wait a minute. And then we like to provide a means to uh, to achieve those desires while also remaining safe. So these ICAP interventions are situated within the larger intervention at key decision points. OK, so the peer guides deliver messages in a, a more gay, positive, affirming manner. I think this is the first video we could play. Whatever happens tonight, we want you to have fun and enjoy yourself. But make smart choices, because we know guys don't always use condoms. That's the truth. Whatever your personal reasons are for not always using condoms, if you have anal sex without a condom, you could get HIV. It's the virus that causes AIDS. And don't think that living with AIDS is no big deal. We don't want you to get this disease. Even though researchers are working on a cure, it still doesn't exist. The cocktail drugs that we do have for AIDS don't work for everyone, and the side effects are no picnic. Using condoms can keep you healthy and sexy. That's what this video is all about. So these characters interrupt throughout the narrative and guide you along providing advice and encouragement. Uh, the second way we kind of try to reduce shame was by modeling these positive self-appraisals. There's lots of low self-esteem in this community, so we try to say, you know what, you're attractive, you're smart, you're funny, all these things. And here's a, and, and, and to acknowledge the sexuality, actually. People tend to go out to bars not thinking that they're going to meet someone, not uh, interested in meeting someone, but it happens. We want to say, hey, stop and just acknowledge that this might happen in anticipation. And next video. <laughs> so this is the partner that you're going to meet a little later in the evening. He has high self-esteem too.
try to simulate as much as possible based on our formative research and pilot studies, uh, a typical evening so that it can be authentic and resonate with the community as much as possible. <laughs> we also try to model behaviors such as looking at condoms for expiration dates, taking it along with you if you're gonna go out in that evening, things that people don't, people forget about them. Ready to go. Okay, and then finally, we wanted to give the participant the power. You're in control of the situation. Don't let this attractive guy tell you what's gonna happen tonight. You tell him what you want. Next video. So, um, what are you into? Well, that all depends. On what? On how I'm feeling and who I'm with. I'm into playing it safely, and I just want to make sure you are too. Oh, you don't have to worry about me, baby. I know, I just I feel more comfortable if we talk about it first. Oh, come on, baby, look at me. I'm clean. Mm -mm. Okay, I promise to chill if we promise to play safe. Okay, all right, I can do that. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy, look at you, all flavors. And sizes. Yeah, you better take one more. <laughs> Congratulations, you've agreed on having safe for set. <laughs> okay, let's move on. So uh, I don't, in the interest of time, I think I can skip over a lot of this. I just let you know that we actually had four conditions in this randomized control trial. We had a waitlist control group. We had the interactive version of the DVD. We also had a non-interactive version to see if interactivity even mattered. Why go through the extra cost of doing that? And then we had a typical one-on-one -on -one counseling session with a real human HIV counselor. Uh, we had a three-month waiting period. They came back at session two for the follow-up. We measured shame using Watson and Clark's uh, Panis X, a widely used measure of emotion. And uh, we saw that shame actually that you're experiencing at this laboratory setting predicted the amount of uh, risky sex that you had uh, in the past three months, uh, verifying that link between shame and sexual risk taking in this particular community, which hadn't necessarily been, uh, been done. Um, here's actually how we reduced the shame. You can see in that first group, the control group actually increased the amount of shame they felt after this waiting period. They sat there ruminating on their, their sexual risk taking behavior because they did not engage in the intervention. Those in the interactive condition and the non-interactive condition, they reduced their shame. Those in the counseling conditions had a slight, slight increase. Um, we did find that in the two conditions where you're actually making decisions, in the interactive video and in the counseling session where it's kind of a role playing that you guide, we did find that reductions in shame were correlated with reductions in future risky sex. Uh, and so that gave us some indication that by Reducing shame, that's one way that we can maybe start to prevent HIV, focusing in on these emotional aspects. Um, so now I'm gonna shift gears to the, the newest, latest version of this solve intervention, a video game with animated characters for younger guys. Um, we're gonna actually do a demo in this, of this in a second, but I just wanna take you through a couple of slides in case we don't quite make it all the way through. You can customize your avatar. Instead of those peer guide characters, we actually have your virtual future self who accompanies you and talks to you throughout the, the interaction and gives you advice along the way. Um, we did lots of pilot research to figure out where people are getting themselves into the biggest trouble, like house parties, for example. Um, we can tailor it to your individual preferences and choices, such as beer versus wine versus liquor, lots of micro behaviors. Uh, now, the skill building comes in with actually teaching people how to initiate a conversation about condoms, negotiate condom, uh, condom use, and then refuse sex if your partner's unwilling. Uh, and then perhaps when you get to the bedroom, your partner changes his mind at the last minute. So we tell you how you can maybe overcome challenges like that. And finally, we model again the behavior, condom use. And I must say, it does get quite uh, graphic and, and, and sexual. We, we designed that on purpose to be arousing. Uh, for state-dependent learning. We think that if we teach you something while you are in this state of arousal, you're more likely to recall that information later in real life when you're similarly aroused. Uh, here's a video of the sex scenes, or at least the beginning of it. I'm not gonna show them in this context, but maybe you could see it afterwards in the social media lounge. Mm -hmm. 
This was the most difficult part of the intervention development, making sure that arms didn't go through chests and so forth. This gives you a, a basic sense of what the bedroom scenes look like. Um, okay, and then at the very end of this, the virtual future self recaps your decisions and again provides advice saying, well, maybe you could have done this differently and this is how it affects your future. So here's an example of at the end of the uh, video game. I wanna play that. So video. you may think negotiating safe sex is awkward. You know what's awkward? Calling a guy six months after you had unsafe sex to tell him you've contracted HIV. And maybe he told you he was negative. Maybe he thought he was. There's really no way to know. That's why you always use a condom when having anal sex. If the guy refuses, even if he's God's gift to gays, he's not worth it. Oh, unless you really do want to make that phone call in six months. Okay. So um, with this particular intervention, we're still kind of wrapping up the randomized control trial, but we did again replicate uh, prior rates of unsafe sex related to shame. Now we did find that uh, shame was reduced in the game condition. And now we're, we are seeing actually an indirect effect. Uh, so shame change is actually a mediator of this process. One of the many, many behavior change techniques uh, is actually, um, we have evidence here that it's responsible for reductions in unprotected anal intercourse there. So this uh, paper is, has just been published last week in a special issue on HIV and stigma in the Journal of the International AIDS Society. So I recommend you go and uh, download that, and I'd be more than happy to send it out to people if you contact me. Okay, and why don't we uh, skip over this in the interest of time. So I think we're going to take a, just a 30-second maybe break right now to actually get the video game loaded, and I'm just going to take you through it in about five minutes, just the beginning, to give you a sense of what it looks like, and then we can uh, go on to... Questions and answers. While that's loading up. Okay. So this is a prototype that we've developed. So you can just, uh, here are the instructions, you can just click through that. Yep. So you can uh, change your ethnicity, your skin tone, you can choose what t-shirt you want to wear, you can choose your eye color, whatever you like. It's very customized. All right. That's you. Hey, it's Jimmy. I'll be at your place in five, so give that mirror one last check and meet me out front. Rumor has it there'll be some hotties galore at this party, so let's find someone to ditch each other for, okay? Ciao. Hey, buddy. It's me. I mean, you. A few years from now. I'll be checking in on you from time to time, just when you need some tips or a nudge in the right direction. Don't worry, I won't mess up your action. Just looking out for you. I mean, me. That's all. You can choose to take a condom or not. Well, let's, let's take Great. it. Great. Now you're protected, just in case. You better get going. You know how impatient Jimmy can get. All right, so let's go to the party. We wanted to incorporate a party on the this first guy level always throws for younger people who can't go to the bar. Ones. So. Cocktail? Sure, let's have a beer. Bottoms up. Here's hoping. A little humor there, sorry. Damn, there are so many hot guys here. I choose that one. Ta-ta. So he ditches you, leaving you to go and interact with the characters. So now you actually can control it yourself, move around and talk to the artificially intelligent characters that have diamonds on their heads. Maybe we could go over and approach any one of those, maybe the guy in the red shirt, and have a conversation with him. You get close to him and click on him. There you go. Hi, I'm Steve. You always start conversations like this. You don't want I to tell me? I flirted with the host without knowing. Ended up staying the night. You? I ran into I a sliding glass door. That. So who do you know at the party? A bunch of people. You? I came with my friend. He knows everyone. Well, I guess I get to play host then. Would you like a drink? Just a beer. Let's dance. Sure. <laughs> this is the most ridiculous part of the intervention, but... <laughs> <laughs> I 
You have really beautiful eyes. Thanks, yours are pretty too. Can't stop looking at them. You don't have to stop. I'm so attracted to you right now. What do you have in mind? I want to have some fun tonight. Get you naked. Sounds fun, where are we gonna go? Oh, well, this is my party. We'll have the place to ourselves soon. Okay, so now we actually get into the educational part of the game. He's gonna offer you a drink after everyone else leaves, and this is where we train you how to use certain conversational techniques, how to use certain dialogue to, to initiate the conversation. Thanks. How about a drink? Okay, but we've already had a lot of beer, but let's do it again. Hey, <laughs> slow down there, buddy. Next time, instead of having so much to drink, why not take it easy and keep a clear head? Okay, so why don't we uh, end it here for the, um, for the, in the interest of time. Uh, I will just briefly explain what happens next. So you get into this conversation and you have to successfully convince him to use a condom. And then when you get into the bedroom, he does change his mind. So you get to use those negotiation skills again. Uh, after that, the wrap up comes. On the second level, you go and repeat the process at a nightclub. And uh, we are finding that people are reducing their sexual risk taking about half over the course of three months. So uh, that, that's it for now. If you'd like to see more of it, including the, uh, the, the sex scenes, you may be able to do that in the social media lounge later. Okay, so we can take, oh, we can take some uh, questions from the floor. What? Yep. Yeah, so there uh, should be two microphones at the back there. This is John McCullough, and um, I recognize that this is a, is a prevention technique around condom use, but the reality is that a lot of guys don't use condoms, won't use condoms, don't want to use condoms. I'm just wondering whether your program has, has also incorporated alternatives to risk reduction other than condom use, and I'm thinking perhaps having sex without anal intercourse, um, strategic positioning, um, the fact that having counterintuitive, though it may seem, having sex with a guy with an undetectable viral load is a way of reducing risk. Um, PEP and PrEP. I'm just wondering whether those alternative uh, tools we have in the prevention toolbox have been part of your thinking as you develop this program. Sure, uh, certainly. Uh, so in this particular intervention, intervention we do uh, encourage people to engage in other activities other than anal sex if no condoms are, are there, for example. And so we give you skills on how to actually say, well, you know, I would actually prefer to have oral sex instead, which may be relatively more safe. Or I would prefer to engage in mutual masturbation, which is something we didn't get to here in the sex scenes, but uh, that's something that we are actually trying to do, to try to get people to an alternative sexual activity. Unfortunately, the other uh, techniques that you mentioned were not included in this. However, the utility, the usefulness of, of, of these types of applications is that, yeah, you can actually go in and modify these fairly easily and quickly and include things that we didn't think of or things that are coming up on the horizon for relatively low cost. I'll Thank you. It. Thank you. I, I just have one other question related to the first video <clears throat> you saw. It talked about um, how you really don't want to live with AIDS. And I just think in, in a developed country like Canada, most of us don't live with AIDS today. We live with HIV. Mm -hmm. And and there's a, I got a sense a little bit of a fear mongering going on there still. Um, yeah. And, and as a person living with HIV, that's problematic. And I think it's interesting that we can tend to say we put the fear of God into people before they're positive, and then you zero convert. Well, everything's going to be fine and wonderful. Don't worry. We've yeah. got all these meds, and there's a there's a disconnect there in that message. I just wanted to. Yeah, I, under, I understand what you're saying, um, and most certainly we um, have addressed those issues from the first intervention in the video game because we've taken this around to a lot of conferences and we've had lots of conversations with people. And uh, one of the actual um, lines in there, I have to mention, these scripts were kind of developed by members of the community. Uh, in consultation with, with us, the researchers, but it was developed by members of the population, and we wanted to get them involved. But there was one line, if you recall, he said, don't worry, I'm clean. Now that mm -hmm. just it insinuates that someone who is HIV positive is not, or has an STD is not, and so that yeah. kind of language was taken out and remedied and fixed 
uh, for the, the latest intervention. We're, we're much more sensitive to the, the tone and, and things like that uh, as, as time went on. That's great sure. to hear. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions there from the floor for John? So there's two sort of um, one that come to mind for me. One in particular is around, um, obviously, I think it's interesting. There's a lot of potential here with this kind of thing. And there has been interest in like mobile applications and online outreach. And but recognizing that technology is constantly changing and adapting and evolving sure. very quickly. Sometimes, so one is how do you guys sort of uh, consider that long term? Mm -hmm. uh, and then my other question would be, what about relationships with um, community-based agencies and folks that are on the ground? And is there the potential for you to deploy programs like this with those kinds of agencies? Okay, so to answer your first question about technology, we actually struggled a lot with this video game. Do we want to make it basic enough that anyone could play it on any computer, or do we want to make it artificially intelligent, they can learn about you, the player, which takes a little bit more uh, higher processing there, right? And so we thought, well, in the nature of this particular context, the randomized control trial is gonna take at least two to three years to complete before we're allowed to even disseminate it. So if we were to go low level, by the time the trial has ended, the technology is already going to be kind of outdated. And so we decided to, to put in a little bit more and high level technology in hopes that when the trial is done, people who may have had lower end computers at that time would now be upgrading and it would be much more widely available. That is a moving target for sure. You have to balance that. And then to answer your second question about CBOs, certainly we're not trying to make any money off of this. This is government funded of course, right? And we would like to get it out there into the hands of as many community-based organizations or educational institutions or clinics as possible. We actually are hosting these uh, interventions online, and if anyone would like a link to that, they're more than welcome to use it in their own educational uh, context uh, for, for no cost. With the, with the DVD, we actually were sitting there printing copies of that and mailing it all across, all across America. So we're definitely interested in making those collaborations and to get this out there in as many hands as possible. Thank you. Is there another question at the back there? Mm -hmm. uh, thanks. Um, I'm just wondering how you're planning on marketing this type of product and how you're going to get it into the CBOs and into uh, academic institutions, which um, are somewhat known for homophobia and stuff, especially in America. So I'm just wondering how that's going to be addressed. Sure. So uh, in terms of marketing, um, we actually have a very talented team of uh, undergraduate volunteers who, who work on these projects, and they spend a lot of their time contacting community-based organizations and sending them kits. They can, they can actually learn more about our research, understand what, we, what we're trying to do, and we provide them with the links, as I mentioned, to do this, to get it into their hands. Um, beyond that, there hasn't really been uh, much of a, a, a marketing effort, especially with this latest video game, which we are still in the process of uh, doing the RCT. But after we're completed, and it's right around the corner, you could imagine how we might seek a grant to actually pay people to do some heavy lifting in terms of real marketing and getting it out there and, and trying to get the message out there and, and, and get this into people's hands. Was there another question? Or? No, okay. What does evaluation look like for the product? So in terms of evaluation, so for the interactive video, we did a about, I would say, two years of evaluation on that. It was very challenging to actually get people to come into our laboratory. Uh, we ended up with about 1,000 participants or so, but it was really teams of graduate students and undergraduates working on Santa Monica Boulevard and West Hollywood, uh, Sunset Boulevard, these types of places, recruiting participants. And we finally, at the end of that period, uh, it was a laboratory study, we finally got an adequate sample size for those four conditions and found that yes, the intervention did reduce unprotected anal intercourse, uh, particularly among the younger members of the population. Now this was designed for 18 to 30 year olds, but we found that 24 and below is really where those reductions in risk were happening. Um, so for that reason, we focused in on 18 to 24 year olds uh, in our randomized control trial of the video game, which came later. And that uh, is currently in, um, I think we just uh, finished actually recruiting quite a, quite a large number, uh, a couple thousand, I believe. And we're analyzing that as we, as we speak nowadays. But it, it, we have evidence that it, that it is actually similarly working to the DVD and to a CD-ROM, which Lynn Miller had developed uh, many, many years ago. Great. Thank you. Thank you. 
So if there aren't any more questions from the floor, I think, um, is there a website or contact information if folks are interested to be able to find or have access to the DVD? Uh, yes, the, the DVD, there's actually a link that we have available, and I, can, I don't remember the website uh, uh, off the top of my head, but I'm more than happy to uh, email it to anyone who's interested. Maybe you could just contact me. I'm here with business cards if you'd like to. I could give those <laughs> out. Um, and then my website where you can find more information about this is jlchristensen.com. You can get in touch with me there as well. And as John mentioned, the game will be set up in the social media room following this. So folks, if you want to engage with it and play with it, you're more than welcome to do that. Mm -hmm. Cool. So if there are no further questions from anyone, I think we'll bring the session to a close. So join me, I guess, in thanking John on, on sharing his wonderful work with us here this afternoon. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> welcome.